We have uh, two speakers. We have Lucy Patino. And Lucy, I'm sorry, I meant to ask you, is it we KTI? Is that how you pronounce the company? Oh, yo, my, my, my website, yeah, it's WECTI. WECTI, okay. So, so Lucy is our Canadian expert. She's uh, six years of experience working exclusively in travel insurance. So this is a unique situation because very often you get specialists in life insurance and specialists in, in you know, commercial insurance and things like this, but Lucy's actually an expert in travel insurance. So that's a pretty wonderful thing. She uh, works with a number of um, insurance brokers as a consultant in the travel sphere and has expense, extensive experience um, insuring snowbirds and helping travelers 60 plus. So really, really glad to have you here, Lucy. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we also have Stan. Stan Sandberg is the co-founder of travelinsurance.com, which uh, we launched in 2013. And the goal is to simplify that complicated world of travel insurance by providing uh, consumers with an easy way of comparing uh, the, the options that are out there. And uh, he is an authority in this area and is recent, you know, frequently speaking on the topic and has been a go-to resource for the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and, and such media outlets. So we're really, really pleased to have you here too, Stan. So well, I, I think we're very fortunate to have two great resources on this, uh, on this call. Thank you very much, Janice. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm very glad to be here and look forward to taking some uh, some good questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you'll probably get some. <laughs> so um, before we get too far under, underway, I would like to uh, just comment. First off, I'm a big believer in travel insurance. I've been traveling since I was 15 out of the country, and I have never gone without travel insurance. So this is a, a topic that I consider to be incredibly important. But I think there are some terms that we want to get sorted away. So why not we get some terminology right off the top? And two of the terms are pre-existing condition and minor ailment. And what do those terms mean in each country? It may be different, it may be the same, I'm not certain. But Lucy, maybe you can start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. So this is really, really key to everything related to uh, the emergency medical travel insurance. So a pre-existing condition, and this is again in general terms, you can find different specific definitions for different insurers, but basically it's a condition for which you have received consultation, presented symptoms, or received a prescription before you go on a trip. And they distinguish this from a minor ailment. Uh, a minor ailment will be really something for which you did not receive, uh, you did not go to the hospital, you did not have to go to see a specialist, and uh, you did not have to take medication for more than, let's say, 15 days. Some insurers will even say a, a minor ailment has to end 30 days before you go on a trip. So even if it was something as um, minor as a cold, if you had it like 10 days before you go on a trip and then you're perfect, that will not fall under a minor ailment, but under pre-existing conditions. Therefore, if you have uh, like a later emergency related to that, it's not gonna be covered. Why? Because it was not considered a pre-existing condition but a minor ailment. So a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, oh, pre-existing conditions, diabetes, high blood, ten high blood pressure or something else. No, these things can also be considered a pre-existing condition. You had a toothache and you go to the dentist, that's a pre-existing condition. And depending on the stability period required by your insurer for the pre-existing condition, it might not be covered later on in your trip, you have again pain on that same tooth and you have to go to get medical attention. So that's one of the key things and key, uh, let's say definitions that you really want to understand before saying, I'm super healthy, nothing's wrong with me, I'm fine. Mm. Just check your policy wording, check the definition or go to uh, for advice with a broker. If you have even the slightest down, just to be sure that you are really gonna be covered for what you think it's uh, maybe a minor ailment or a pre-existing, what could be a pre-existing condition. Again, don't stay in the, I think so, just go and uh, either 
look your policy wording or uh, talk to your broker. That's that's really interesting because I wouldn't have thought it. A, a call that I had two weeks ago could be a pre-existing condition, but yeah. that, that some is. some insurers will yeah. say no because it has to end thirty days before you go on your trip. So that sore throat you had, it's not covered if it didn't end. It treatment didn't end thirty days before you go. And again, it, this might vary from one insurer to the other. But mm -hmm. again, the thing is, you really want to check if it is a pre-existing condition or a minor ailment. Uh, yeah. What's so, the situation in the states, Stan? Yeah, so I'll speak to the uh, the, the way uh, pre-existing condition language works uh, for uh, U.S. residents uh, who are buying uh, travel insurance, and and you you typically will see um, uh, pre-existing condition language even in the trip cancellation plan. So um, you know, distinguishing from uh, the international travel medical plans, uh, many people uh, in the U.S. Um, are more familiar with the the bundled plans that include trip cancellation coverage as well as emergency medical and, and, and evacuation coverage. Uh, but the way the pre-existing condition language works in the US actually is quite similar to how Lucy just described. Um, they're going to define it as a, uh, a condition, an, an ailment, um, uh, some sort of medical uh, issue that, um, that presented itself that um, required you to either seek uh, treatment or consultation with a doctor or a change in prescription. And I'll get back to that one in a second because that's an important one. Um, and so the way, um, so, so that definition actually can differ again uh, by plan, plan by plan or provider by provider, but, but typically it, they, they work the, the same way. Um, the, the variation that you will see is what we call the look back period for a pre-existing condition. So some plans will look back in the prior 60 days. And if there were any of these sort of changes, consultations to see a doctor and so forth within the prior 60 days, that would be considered a pre-existing condition. Other plans will actually look back 180 days. Um, and so you want to all else being equal, find a plan that has the shortest look back period. Um, and, um, and that you know, will not sort of put you in a situation where there is sort of a gotcha moment. You know, if, if a half, you know, half a year ago, something occurred, uh, you know, in some plans that that might um, uh, be considered a pre-existing condition. Um, one other uh, differentiation, um, uh, it, and when I refer to the change in prescription as a kind of a trigger for a pre-existing condition, um, if you um, are on a maintenance medication, so if you're on, um, uh, for instance, a, a cholesterol medication or low uh, blood pressure medication, and uh, you've been stable um, in that, you know, during that look back period, so whether it's 60 or 180 days, you haven't had to see your doctor uh, about it, or you haven't had a change in your um, your prescription level, uh, then that would not be considered a pre-existing condition. Um, so again, uh, there's a differentiation between sort of this sort of normal maintenance type of um, uh, situation versus a situation that may have um, changed or required some kind of um, uh, you know some kind of intervention. Um, and then one other concept, which um, is very important for people to understand um, with a pre-existing condition. Um, uh, again, the travel insurance, the starting point is that they're going to exclude coverage for losses that uh, come out of uh, either directly or indirectly uh, that are due to a pre-existing condition. So that's a pretty big exclusion as a starting point. The way that you can avoid that big exclusion is by buying a plan that has a pre-existing exclusion waiver. And that's where you will see in many travel insurance plans where they talk about the pre-existing uh, uh, pre condition exclusion waiver. Um, most plans, certainly at the kind of standard and premium level, will have a waiver built into the plan. The important piece to uh, understand is that there's some conditions or some requirements uh, to qualify for that waiver. 
the most important one is that you purchase your policy within a um, time frame from when you made that first payment towards the trip. So if you put down a $50 deposit on a trip, that kind of indicates that that's a trip you're, you know, you're planning and you're, you know, you're planning on going on. So um, uh, plans typically require you to purchase your insurance within seven up to 21 days from that initial deposit date in order to qualify for the pre-existing condition exclusion waiver. Um, and so I know that's a lot of information, but the general rule, again, to think about is if you have a pre-existing condition, um, you will want to buy your travel insurance early when you first make that payment on a trip, then buy your travel insurance. And I'm going to throw in a wrench because with all travel insurance, it seems like there's always like a, an exception to the rule. Um, there are some plans which will provide that waiver if you, uh, as long as you purchase the insurance within 24 hours of your final trip payment. So that's actually one to look out for because that gives you a little bit more flexibility. So maybe you made a deposit on a trip, you, um, you, you didn't buy your insurance within seven days or 21 days, but you want to consider it as long as you're purchasing the insurance prior to your final payment date, uh, then uh, those types of plans will include the pre-existing condition waiver, exclusion waiver. So, um, and then as a sort of a catch-all, again, because everybody's situation might be different, it's really important that if you have questions about it, you just pick up the phone and call uh, the uh, call center, um, speak to an agent, uh, speak to a company, um, whether you're shopping on a comparison site like travelinsurance.com or you're going directly to one of the insurance carriers. Uh, they will be able to answer your questions and, and they will also be able to uh, get into some of the specifics as well. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I have to comment because it's really different in Canada. You were mentioning that they have to purchase before they make a deposit. And for us, it's uh, it's really two separate things. So we don't care when we were talk if we're talking specifically about emergency medical insurance. So the the medical insur the, the insurance that will take care of your medical expenses in the event you have a medical emergency. We don't care when you purchase that trip. It can be an annual plan, and that's okay. We care about the uh, or insurance in Canada will want to see what is your situation and the condition. If you are stable, what you call a look back, we call a, a stability period. So how long has your pre-existing condition been stable? And just to give you an idea of one of the most common definition of stable, and this is not and or, it's all and, it's the condition for which you have not had any deterioration or worsening of symptoms, no change in treatment, meaning dosage has not been increased, decreased, stopped, or started. Uh, you have not had any new treatment prescribed or recommended by a physician, and uh, um, yeah, and no new symptoms or findings. So all these are and and and. Your pre-existing condition has to meet all these criteria. In Canada, is depending on age travel length and insure it, it can even go all the way to one year before the departure date. So this is where you really want to shop around to see. Some insurers will say you're 74 years old, you're not traveling for more than 31 days, you just have 30, uh, 90 days of uh, pre-existing condition stability period. But if you go just for one more day, or you go to for um, if you're 75, then you have 180 days. So it really depends. And that's when you really want to look at the different options. Now, specifically about pre-existing conditions, we also have not a waiver. We call it an unstable pre-existing condition rider. So it's not really an exclusion to the pre-existing uh, condition. It's rather like... Um, it's like a shortening of the stability period. It's not offered by all insurers, unfortunately. It's, um, 
just a, a few ones will offer this option and they say, okay, you, were, you have high blood pressure and your doctor three months ago just changed your dosage. So it's good because they lowered it, but for as a per definition of the of stability for the insurer, you're not stable. So with this rider, which comes, I have to say, at an extra premium, we're gonna reduce and instead of asking you to uh, of you to be stable, let's say 180 days before you go on the trip, we're gonna reduce the stability period to just seven days before you go on your trip. And you can purchase this anytime whenever you want. Uh, in this sense, it's not like in the US where you have to have a book your trip or made your first payment uh, at a specific date. You cannot even have a trip plan. You can just want to buy your insurance, but we really want to know how, um, how the stability period will uh, come into play for your first trip and see in that case the need or not, depending on your specific situation. That's why we cannot say this as a general rule, you will have to, again, to talk to a broker. If at that time for a specific trip, you are going to need the rider or not. Wow. <laughs> I thought this was going to be the easy question. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. Um, I do have a question. So the maintenance, uh, maintenance medications. So what you suggest, what I interpreted from what you said is that if I say I have a blood pressure problem, and I have been on the same blood pressure medication for you know, a year or six months or whatever the minimum time is, and that's not been changed. That is not considered a pre-existing condition? Oh, yes, it is. You have a stable pre-existing condition because you have not had any new symptoms or worsening of symptoms. Your treatment has not changed. You have not been prescribed new treatment. Everything's been the same. And I've had clients like that. They say, I've been taking the same thing for 20 years. Suddenly they go to a checkup and the doctor says, oh, you're doing great. I'm going to lower your dosage. And they have a trip in one month. They call me and they say, Lucy, I just had, I'm so happy. And I say, yeah, but stable, we don't care about the de doctor's definition. We care about the insurer's definition. You're not stable, but I'm doing fine. He lowered the dosage. Right. Sorry. Right. I can offer them that on, on unstable pre-existing condition rider and said, okay, right now, instead of asking a stability of 180 days or 365 days, we're gonna reduce it to seven days. In those seven days, you really, really have to be stable. Again, no new symptoms, no change, no nothing, right. uh, but it's gonna be covered. But high blood pressure, all those kind of, again, we have to look at, is it a pre-existing condition or is it a minor ailment? I, minor ailment is, you're not taking medication for more than 15 days. Right. So, so yeah, in, in the US, again, it's going to be different. And, and the concept that I described um, is, is unique then to, um, to, to US plans. Right. So in, in that instance, um, uh, as long as there hasn't been a change in, in, in your prescription, you haven't uh, sought uh, med you haven't gone to visit a doctor uh, for the condition, um, and uh, so everything has, and nothing has changed during that look back period, uh, then that will not be considered a pre-existing condition, but by the definition of, for the exclusion. So, um, uh, so, you know, if, if you don't meet that, you know, if, if you, if you have a, a, a pre-existing condition uh, based on the definition, uh, then you will want to seek a plan that offers a exclusion waiver. And, um, and again, the difference in the U S is that they, that these trip cancellation plans, which also include, uh, emergency medical expense coverage, um, they will, uh, they will waive the preexisting condition exclusion if you meet the, the purchase requirements. But again, this is, uh, specifically, uh, uh, for U.S. trip cancellation plans. Wow. So that's, yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty complicated stuff with it when we get into the pre-existing piece of things. That's, that's, that was, that was a surprise to me. <laughs> I, you know, the notion that in the U.S., if you've been, stay, say you've been, if I'm interpreting this correctly, that you've been 
stabilize, stable on blood pressure med for 20 years, then that's not a pre-existing? For purposes of the exclusion in the plan, so as, again, as long as you haven't changed your prescription, you haven't gone to the doctor in the look back period, you haven't had any sort of change in anything, um, uh, then that it, it may, it, it's still a, a pre-existing condition, but it's not going to trigger the exclusion for a loss that may have come out of it. So if nothing has changed, you haven't had any issue, you haven't changed prescription, you haven't seen a doctor, there's been no symptoms, you, again, it, it, everything is exactly the same as it's been for the last, you know, five years, and then you go on your trip, and something happens related to your high blood pressure, which causes you to incur some kind of a loss for the trip, whether it's trip cancellation or uh, have to seek medical um, uh, a care. Uh, if you have a pre-existing uh, condition exclusion waiver, you would have coverage for that uh, specific event during the trip. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, okay, let's um, uh, jump on to, uh, an, oh, we've got, a, we've got a question. I can see Tracy going like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So I have a couple. Okay. Um, the I'm first one. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the first one is specific to U.S. plans. Um, uh, Maria wants to know if someone had a heart attack three years before their trip with no new meds or events before their trip, then they have a heart attack while they're on the trip. Um, on a trip they've purchased travel trip, will their trip be, wait, this doesn't sound right. They had a heart attack three years before the trip, no new meds or events before their trip. Then they have a heart attack on a trip they've purchased travel insurance for, will they be covered under that insurance if it happens while they're traveling? Is that a US question? Yeah. US, yeah. Okay, so if I'm, if, let me just repeat this so I got it right. Um, uh, an individual had a heart attack three years ago. As a result of that heart attack, there was no, uh, uh, there was no medication prescribed. There was no sort of, there, there, no, nothing other than the heart attack three years ago, nothing happened since then. And then a uh, heart attack occurs during the trip. Um, uh, if you have a, uh, and you've purchased travel insurance, you've had nothing that would meet the definition of a pre-existing condition, you would have coverage um, uh, for that trip. So the coverage being, you'd have um, uh, trip interruption uh, coverage. So to the extent you had uh, trip expenses that were prepaid that you were subject to, to, to lose, uh, you, you may have co that, that coverage may be um, uh, relevant. Uh, the um, emergency medical expense coverage, um, again, you're, you're covered up to a limit uh, defined in the plan. Um, and that um, and that would be for medical expenses, recovered medical expenses incurred uh, during your trip. So, um, so, so yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have another question for you, Stan. <laughs> um, Gloria is wondering, she asks, if I get COVID in Europe and I want to fly home to the US on a medical plane, not a commercial plane, are there policies that will cover that under emergency medical? Um, the standard emergency evacuation coverage in the uh, the trip cancellation plans, which um, which I sort of referred to, um, are still going to be subject. So th it's going to be um, it's going to be determined by the third party um, uh, emergency services provider. So depending on the situation, um, you know, they'll make a determination of how to get you home. Um, it's not going to be dictated by what you want. Um, uh, you know, in some cases, plans may have a hospital of choice. So to the extent you are able to be, uh, you know, medevac home, you can, deter you can sort of say which hospital you want to be um, you know, taken to. Um, there are there are standalone emergency um, evacuation plans um, 
we currently are not partnered with them on our site, so I can't speak to the the um, the specifics. But there are companies like MedJet, for instance, that are uh, have some membership services um, who uh, may afford you more flexibility and and may even provide services which would uh, allow you to um, med you know uh, meta back home or, or air ambulance home. Um, and it's important to um, the, the important consideration there is that um, uh, you know the the evacuation or the return home trip is excuse me is going to be dictated by what the regulations are sort of the government regulations are you able to um, you know are, are you able to sort of repatriate with COVID um, you know what are the you know what are the particular state requirements and how is that handled um, and and you know and certainly in, in in the case of commercial airlines what their protocols are, you'll find more flexibility in these standalone emergency back plans. Okay, thank you, um, Lucy. We have one for you now. Um, Catherine is asking uh, for Canadian travelers. Uh, about getting emergency medical insurance when you're 80 years and older. Yes, there are plans. There are some plans that don't have an age limit. So um, premium is basically de determined by the period of coverage, so the length of your trip. Of course, we have some annual plans and things, but basically that your age and very importantly, the way you answer the medical questionnaire. That's one of the key uh, things, elements that factor in into the calculation of your premium. One thing I wanted, because when, when I, as I heard Stan uh, talking, I just wanted to make sure and clarify that for Canada, for Canadian insu uh, travel insurance, the fact that you have a pre-existing condition doesn't mean that you're not going to be covered. So one thing is you have a pre-existing condition. Another thing is, is it stable? Yes or no as per the definition of the company and for the stability period required by the company. If that's a yes, you're covered for the pre-existing condition. And one thing is your pre-existing condition, let's say that you're not stable and it's not gonna be covered. That doesn't mean that other unrelated conditions or medical emergencies are not gonna be covered. When there's a claim, they're gonna see is this claim related, um, we have to say directly or indirectly to a pre-existing condition, yes or no? Is the pre-existing condition stable for the period required as per our definition, yes or no? So this is when we, ca when we can give you very personal advice. So just to make sure you have a pre-existing condition, that's fine. We just wanna know that you're stable and if not, that you're gonna be covered maybe with a rider. Right. Okay. I just have one more question before we get back to <laughs> back to it. And this one is for Stan. Uh, Warren would like to know, first of all, if you're familiar with U.S. military provided TRICARE overseas? I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. What, what, what is it called? U.S. military TRICARE? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so it's what was... I'll, 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 I'll look into because I, I, okay. I'm not familiar with it now. Okay. He says that it covers 80% of medical expenses incurred out of the U.S. or military facilities. And his question was about whether you would think it would be necessary to buy additional insurance. Um, but, um, yeah. Well, that does raise a question that's related to my next question. So, um, you know, price obviously is a big issue when it comes to buying travel insurance for seniors because it can get really expensive. So my question is, do you have any tips and recommendations on how seniors can manage the price factor of their insurance to keep that price down? And then connected to that, that previous question, I think it was from Warren, is um, it, you know, does it make sense under certain circumstances to buy top-up insurance? And is that even a possibility? You know, if you've got a certain amount of coverage uh, through a union or whatever, uh, is top-up insurance a possibility? So, it, but it's basically a question about price. How do we manage the price and keep it, keep it under control? 
Well, um, the price thing, there's uh, a few things that you can do. First of all is, uh, okay. The way you answer the medical questionnaire is really, really uh, important. And, and there's nothing you can do about so. So um, sometimes you can really be amazed at the difference of price because even if it's exactly the same price, uh, the same trip, so you're going for a 70 day trip or a 90 day trip. And of course it's the same age, the same person, but the questionnaire is different because it's different for the insurer. Some insurer have 16 questions, other have 12, so, and sub questions and things like that. So you can have a very high premium with one because of their specific questionnaire and a more interesting or affordable premium with another because of their questionnaire. So you really wanna shop around. Don't just go, I know it can be, you know, Oh, another 10 minutes with the agent asking, in the past five months, have you had any of the following? I know it's obnoxious, but yeah, take the time. And this is um, parenthesis, please purchase your travel insurance before you go. I've had many clients saying, oh, I'm already on my trip. In Canada, when you're looking for coverage after departure, uh, that's a whole game changer. So we have its other underwriting rules. So you have more options when you are purchasing while you're still in your home province, even if it's one day before. So uh, shop around, okay? Of course, it's, well, stay healthy so you can give like no, 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 no to all the answers. That's the best way to go about it. Because even with age, I mean, it's, I've seen like uh, people 88, 89, that just answer no to everything. And they have a pretty, you know, affordable premium compared to people 65 that have to say a lot of yes, because by the way, the medical questionnaire, it's just a yes or no, yes or no, yes or no answer. There's no way of yes, but this and that. No, it's just yes or no, and boom, then you have your premium. So the other, don't be afraid to ask for a deductible. Deductible is that the amount for which you are responsible in any claim. Sometimes it goes to, um, in Canada, unfortunately, uh, with some insurers, the, deduct the premium is always Canadian dollars, but the uh, deductible is in US dollars. And why? Because the US is the most expensive place for medical <laughs> services. So that's why they put it uh, in, uh, the deductible is payable in US dollars. But sometimes it's really worth it to say, uh, yeah, to reduce your premium. So don't be afraid to ask uh, for a quote, including different deductible options. And the other is depending on your travel needs and dates, an annual plan might be a more uh, cost affordable um, option than just going with single trip plans. So talk to your broker to see in your case, what will be the more cost-effective option for you. Interesting, okay. Stan, what, what do you have to say on this matter, yeah, on this so, money matter? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, again, speaking from the US perspective, um, interestingly, uh, travel insurance, the, the cost or the premium for travel insurance is actually regulated. Uh, by each individual state, just like all insurance products in the U.S. are regulated at the state level, including the pricing. And so, um, so what that means is, um, if you were to price out a plan for one uh, individual product from one provider, you were to price out your trip for that provider and plan, that price you're going to get is going to be the same price you're going to get anywhere you price it out. So whether you go directly to the provider or you go to a comparison site or you go to, you know, you know, you go down the block. Um, but where, so you're not gonna be able to sort of necessarily um, price shop a individual plan, but where you can um, actually find, um, uh, where you can price shop is between providers. And that's where a uh, comparison site like a travelinsurance.com, and there are a number of other sites out there that you can choose from, um, uh, you'll be able to actually find a, a plan that may be more cost effective for your particular trip because provider A is charging you, I'm making this number up, but it's going to charge you $100 for your, for your, uh, your policy, uh, but provider B might be charging 75 or 65 and um, and so and and you might 
you know, in that comparison, discover that basically all of the uh, benefits and coverage limits are the same. It's just how that particular provider and underwriter uh, price their risk. So you can get um, you can get a lot of really good um, cost effective options by sort of shopping around and a comparison site lets you do that quickly. Now, um, the, 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 the thing I want to talk about, um, uh, yeah, how, you know, how insurance is priced here, there are two variables typically uh, that determine how much a um, travel insurance plan here will cost. That's age and trip costs. Mm -hmm. If you're not interested in insuring your trip costs, like you don't need the trip cancellation or the trip interruption coverage, then the, the, the variable or the factor will, will be age. And, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and these are for single trip, you know, there's a start and an end date uh, associated with it. Um, those plans can actually be quite affordable. Um, and, um, and again, in the US, uh, the, the kind of coverage that you're going to get in a, or the medical expense coverage you're going to get in a, um, a travel insurance plan. I, I'm making the assumption here, it's, it's actually different coverage than what you would get in a, a Canadian plan. And as, as, as Lucy described, there may be more limitations on it, but you're not going to be asked the series of questions uh, relating to your pre-existing pre condition or your health. Um, it's just going to be age factor based. Um, but um, I, I did actually a, a sample price quote, uh, excluding the trip cancellation coverage. So in, in some cases, if you just enter zero trip costs into a quote form, whether that be at a provider site or a comparison site, you enter zero trip costs, that will give you the cost of that plan um, with um, all of that plan's benefits, including the emergency medical and evacuation. Uh, but it will not have trip cancellation coverage. And I, and I, I quoted a 65-year-old um, traveling for a week in July. Um, I think I may have quoted it from the state of California. And there were uh, plans ranging from uh, a, a low of $30 up to a high of, I think it was $85. And so that's for, that's for coverage for that uh, one-week trip. Uh, the price probably is not going to change considerably if you um, uh, are traveling up to 30 days. Once you go over 30 days, the price does go up. But um, uh, but but the medical expense limit in the range of products was, uh, I believe, it was a low of like 25,000 of medical expense coverage, up to um, uh, 250,000 of uh, medical expense coverage limit. So. Um, it, it's it it's not. I mean, I, I think for for many people, well, at least for the 65 year old, that um, uh, may be more reasonable than some people would um, would expect. But you also have to think about what you're buying, right? Because 25,000 may not go very long, very far in some circumstances, but it may go really far if you know if you're in Southeast Asia or someplace where you know, uh, medical coverage is not quite as expensive. So um, I guess there's a lot of factors. The question I've got for you is that on a price comparison site, um, uh, what happens with the medical questionnaire? There's none, right, I understand. That, no, there's not a medical questionnaire. Um, but what, um, where it will become important is if you have a claim, a medical claim, and then uh, in the claims process, you will have to provide information to establish whether there was a pre-existing condition that was, uh, you know, a cause of the loss. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you're not getting asked those questions up front, um, uh, but you'll have to provide, obviously, um, you know, medical history and information uh, during the claims process. So this is where you have to read the fine print because you could be choosing something that is less expensive and um, uh, you think you've got the coverage, but if you read the fine print, it's then it's set, then it talks about the pre-existing instability and things of that nature, and you could be not covered for something specific if you were not stable. Well, yeah. So that's why it's important to when you're when you're purchasing a plan to um, you know 
see whether that plan is offering a pre-existing condition waiver. Um, you know, uh, comparison sites typically will tell you when you run the quote based on the trip details you've entered, uh, whether a plan is gonna have a pre-existing condition waiver or not. Um, and, then, uh, and then it is important um, if you are concerned uh, to, to read the definition of a pre-existing condition and then the terms of it. If you're not comfortable reading the, those terms, then picking up the phone is, is absolutely a very quick way to, to find out whether uh, that plan is gonna meet your needs. Right. So in addition to the site, you've got you've got a, a call center that can answer these kind of questions. Yes. Okay. Um, this is really, really, um, wow, like very uh, surprised because it's very different in Canada. Just to give you an idea, regularly the coverage in Canada is $5 million. So today I made a quote for a client, 88 years old, an annual plan, multi-trip, so she can make as many trips as she wants during the year of coverage, 16 days per trip. She answered all no to the medical questionnaire. Uh, she has high blood pressure, but stable. Her premium was 900 Canadian dollars. And, uh, but you know, it's almost incomparable to the product that you have in the US because, and of course, you also have the age, 65 versus 88, but she had yeah. to answer a 16 question questionnaire. And that's what get, helped her get a lower premium, but she has $5 million of coverage. So meaning that wherever she is in the world on her 16 day trip, which she has already within her annual plan, if she needs medical evacuation or stay in the hospital or whatever, she, it's very, very uncommon to go above a claim of a million dollars. So she's in that sense, very, very well covered. Uh, but I understand that in products like in the US where you're, you're reduced to trip, it's, you know, it's just for a week or maybe 10 days and the age and all that. So it's really, uh, not easy to compare because they are yeah. different products. So, yeah, again, as Sam was saying, just call uh, the, the broker just to get all the information you need about that specific product. So, but don't go online and say, "Oh, I go online in the U.S. and then in the in the in Canada," because it's really very different for what I'm learning uh, from from Stan. Yeah, and and yeah, so and and that's you know that's an, a very important point, um, the the plans that I'm speaking about, you're required to be a U.S. resident. So you need to be residing in one of the, um, obviously one of the U.S. states. The terms of that plan are going to be dictated by the state's insurance form or the, the, that plans form for that particular state. So if you live, um, if you're a resident outside the U.S. and you think that buying a U.S. policy is going to save you money and you might sort of that, that, that's not going to work. Um, and, and likewise, if you're a Canadian resident buying a U.S. plan, that's not going to work. And you may be able to, you know, you may be able to purchase it online, but, you know, if you have a claim, you're not going to be covered. So. Yeah. yeah. Insurance that doesn't cover you is not insurance. <laughs> yeah. Pretty simple. Um, Lucy, I have a question. You mentioned when we were talking about price, that um, raising the deductible could save you some money. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to lower the coverage from five million to say one million? No, that's not a possibility. Okay, okay. Well, uh, you, you, you also asked something about top up. Yes, we do have top up insurance in Canada. So if you have 15 days with your visa card or you have a group plan that gives you 60 days and you're going for 90 days, Yes, we do have top up insurance. So top up is one portion of the trip is covered by one insurer and another top another insurance is going to top up that the first one to finish the trip. Right. OK. So these are covered with the group plan and then comes the private insurance you can get through a broker to cover the rest of your trip. Right. And what about in the US, Stan? Um, I, I, we don't refer to it as, as top up insurance, um, but there are, you know, a couple of concepts to sort of consider, um, uh, travel insurance in the U S is going to be either 
considered primary or secondary coverage. Um, and so primary coverage means that if you have a claim or a loss uh, and a covered claim, the travel insurance will be the first uh, insurance paid out for that loss. Um, uh, and as you might imagine, primary plans will tend to be on the premium side of the, you know, the set of options. Secondary coverage, uh, or it's sometimes known as excess coverage, will be coverage which will pay out uh, once you've exhausted your other uh, insurance sources. Um, so if you have uh, existing health coverage that might cover a particular situation, but it doesn't cover all of it, uh, then uh, the travel insurance would cover the excess. So what, what wasn't covered by your insurance. If you don't have any other insurance, um, then a secondary plan is effectively a primary plan. So as long as, if you don't have any other insurance sources, then uh, the travel insurance will cover, uh, will be the first to pay. Right, right. Tracy, do we have questions? We do. What a surprise. <laughs> Um, the first one is just for clarification, when we're talking about travel insurance, does that include trip cancellation, trip interruption, emergency medical, just one or a combination? In, in the US, uh, um, most people will, it, it, the short answer is yes in the US. Um, the, the plans that most people will see, whether it uh, be through their travel agent, through um, you know, shopping on one of the online travel agencies like Expedia or Orbitz, or maybe even through one of the airlines. When you get to the end of your 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 shopping experience, they might present you with the the check option to purchase insurance. Those plans tend to be a combination of trip cancellation coverage, uh, trip interruption, um, uh, medical coverage, and evacuation coverage. You'll also typically see benefits like trip delay coverage or um, personal belongings, so baggage loss or baggage delay. Um, and so um, we, we don't like the term bundled plans. Uh, the insurance industry doesn't like to use that term, but effectively there are a number of benefits bundled in these plans. Um, there, there are available also just medical only plans or emergency evacuation only plans as well. But for the most part in the US, people are going to see plans that include um, you know, a range of those options. OK. And is that the same in Canada? No, not really, not in Canada. <laughs> so in Canada, travel insurance will be like an umbrella concept for different kinds of coverage. So basically, and one of the most important that even the province, you know that we have provincial health coverage in Canada. So the part uh, of a claim outside Canada, a very small portion, eight to 10% of uh, claim outside of Canada will be covered by the province. And in that sense, travel insurance will be access to the province coverage, okay? So um, the, the um, uh, we were saying about, okay, so you have the emergency medical insurance, which is, let's say, the most important, like 80% of my sales are emergency medical exclusively. Very, very important. And we also have trip cancellation interruption and baggage and even what we call car rental protection. So you can ask me, Lucy, I would like to have, for example, an emergency medical policy that includes trip cancellation interruption, or I can send a cell as a standalone plan. So just trip cancellation interruption that will not cover any medical at all. And this is a key difference with the US plans. If you just purchase trip cancellation interruption, you have a medical emergency in, in, in a destination. We're going to refund the uh, prepaid non-refundable travel expenses, so the hotel nights that were already paid and whatnot, but we're not going to pay anything related to the medical treatment you receive due to an emergency because it's not medical emergency travel insurance. It's just trip cancellation interruption. The only thing covered by trip cancellation interruption is the non-refundable prepaid travel arrangements. That's it. 
So that's why we always wanna focus on the emergency medical because it's what is the biggest risk of, of a financial thing or breakdown or whatever when you are away on a trip, right? So that's why the, the, the Canadian industry focuses a lot on the emergency medical, but we also have these other types of coverage. And when, we, when you need the whole thing, we do also have packages, we call them packages. Okay. Um, and this question, the first part of this question actually would be interesting to hear from both of you. And the second part is just about Canada. So the first part is, do all- ready. Try to keep them sure the answers concise because we are supposedly finished in three minutes, which obviously we will not be. That's that's fine by us, but we need to be tight. Okay. okay. So the first part is: Do all insurance brokers sell travel insurance? And the second part is: In Canada, do you need a specialized travel insurance broker? And if so, how do you find one? Well, I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, uh, the answer is no, not all insurance brokers sell travel insurance. Many may do so. Um, you'll see more travel agents who sell travel insurance than insurance brokers. Um, although uh, in, the, in the US, um, uh, there, I'm gonna speak very generally here. Uh, most People who, who sell travel insurance are required to be licensed to sell travel insurance, uh, and they must hold insurance licenses to do so. Um, uh, there is also a travel insurance license, which is um, uh, very different from a, an insurance broker who holds a, uh, a health insurance license or a property and casualty license. So. Um, typically travel agents will hold that travel insurance license to sell. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I think the one really sort of key takeaway should be that, um, you know, travel insurance in the U S when it's bundled together with trip cancellation coverage is a very, very different product than, um, than travel insurance in, in Canada and, and the, the services that Lucy provides that expertise is, is, is really, um, yeah, it's a critical component of selling in Canada when you're when, when you're talking about, you know, the, the medical piece alone, the stakes are very high. And that's when you need really a specialist to help you with it. In the US, it's it's a little different. In Canada, you have to have a license it's called accident and sickness license. So you have to be an insurance agent uh, in Quebec. Specifically, uh, there are some uh, travel agencies basically that have a special distribution. Um, they have a distribution permit, but they cannot give advice. They can only make the sale, but they are not allowed to give advice to the client. That's right. And other than that, you want to make sure that the, the broker or the agent is licensed and that they know about travel insurance, which unfortunately is not always the case. They say sell mainly life insurance and occasionally sell travel insurance, and that's where mistakes can be made. And just to add to that, um, you know, many times uh, when a travel agent um, who holds the travel insurance license to sell, or it's, it's much like a distribution license, they're not allowed to talk about specific benefits. They're just allowed to sell it. Um, uh, you know, th they are not necessarily going to be familiar with even what they're selling. They're very good at, at selling destinations. Um, generally not so good at selling insurance. And that's where it becomes really important to pick up the phone and, and speak to a, a licensed agent. Okay, I just have one, one last question. Um, could you give us um, an example of where purchasing annual insurance is more appropriate or sort of pros and cons of, of um, annual versus uh, trip specific? Annual trip? I'll just very quickly, whenever you have a long trip, so this is specifically for snowbirds, whenever we make a comparison of a single trip for four months and the annual plan with what we call an extension, always no questions asked. The sweet spot is with the 35 day or 31 day annual plan with an extension. Sometimes you have differences of $500 or $1,000 in premium between the annual plan with the extension or and the, and the single trip. 
or the four month trip of the snowbirds during the winter. So we always want to compare it, depend on the travel uh, needs and the travel dates, uh, which one will be the more cost effective option, annual or single trip. And that goes as well as in terms of frequency of trips as well. If yeah. you're traveling frequently, it's traveling three, four, five times a year, an annual plan is likely going to make more sense. But for, for uh, snowbirds, even if it's their one trip, it's just one four months, so a very long trip, and it's the only one, still the annual plan with the, ex with the extension is going to be the more cost-effective option. Right, right. But the majority of people on the, on the call are not snowbirds, but people oh, who okay. taking multiple trips. Okay. Yeah, in that case, we'll just have to see if they travel more than once in the year. Yeah, the annual plan will be a better option. We, 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 we sort of say, um, if you're traveling three times a year, you might price out the differences to, to see if you're traveling four or more times a year, um, a multi-trip or annual plan is probably going to be um, uh, a cost-effective option for you. Okay. Now I do have one more. Um, uh, so Maria is asking, can you get uh, yearly insurance for several different trips to different destinations? And is that cheaper than buying um, separate coverage for each trip? But that would be like an annual plan, would it? Yeah, not? The, the multi trip annual plan. So um, I, I, my answer would be the same. Yeah. Okay. Annual plans are worldwide. So once you have it, you can go wherever you want. Okay. And Rose was just asking for some clarification, um, Lucy, about what annual insurance with extension means. Oh, so when you purchase an annual, uh, it's an annual multi-trip. So multiple trips within the year, but limited to an, a specific trip length, let's say 30 days or 20 days. So you can make all the trips you want limited to the 20 days or 30 days. But let's say that you want to make a trip to Europe that's 45 days. You call us and we add an extension for that specific trip with those specific dates to complete your trip. So if you have a 30 day multi-trip annual plan, we're gonna add 15 days to that specific trip so you can go to Europe. And you're just gonna pay the difference in premium of those 15 days. That's the extension. Okay. Uh, I have one more question that I think really has to get out here though. I've got like three questions I haven't asked yet because it's been so robust the conversation. but. Uh, you know, the concern that everyone has is COVID-19 and the coronavirus and the like. Um, are most insurance companies doing about the same thing around uh, coverage for the coronavirus COVID-19 or uh, is there a wide variety and we need to be looking carefully at that as well? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take this. Um, um, sort of the big change that occurred um, as a result of COVID-19, um, uh, U.S. Uh, travel insurance plans, um, the way they were originally designed, excluded coverage for pandemics or epidemics. Obviously, we um, had a pretty big um, uh, pandemic um, and, uh, and subsequently um, modified their sort of rules and uh, started to treat COVID-19 as any other medical condition. So um, uh, again, if if one were to contract COVID unexpectedly uh, prior to or during the trip, uh, and that person had uh, uh, travel insurance in place, uh, there would be coverage for that um, for that um, uh, that event. So um, and 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 most U.S. Uh, travel insurance plans are handling COVID that way. There are some nuances between different providers and some other benefits that may sort of fall under the COVID umbrella are gonna differ between providers. And again, that's, that, that, that's, that's something that, um, uh, you know, pick up the phone if you have a question about. Okay, so is the um, pandemic not covered is still in place ex with the exception of COVID-19? Is that what you're saying? Is that if another pandemic arose, thank, you know, hopefully not, um, that wouldn't be covered by COVID-19? Uh, you know, I, I can't answer that, how, how the insurance carriers or the underwriters are gonna view that, but I can tell you that um, because the, 
the, the forms of the insurance are filed at the state level and, and it's a very sort of long or lengthy process of, of getting sort of those approved by the states and through um, uh, these um, sort of amendments were made with respect specifically to COVID-19. Okay. And Lucy, what, what are we dealing with in Canada? So in Canada, what it's important to know is that you have to make the distinction between COVID for emergency medical and COVID for trip cancellation interruption. COVID, since it is a known reason to cancel or interrupt your trip, is not covered for trip cancellation interruption. For medical emergency, most insurers have coverage either as a rider to the plan, as a standalone plan, or uh, uh, let's say as uh, together sold in tandem with the basic emergency medical coverage. Um, and just one, one insurer will include it as part of the coverage in the same way sort of as in the US, like as any other pre-existing condition, are you stable or not? And then COVID, if you uh, get sick with it later in your, in your trip, it, would, it could be covered. If not, you have to have that rider so if you, if you have your emergency medical policy, but you didn't purchase that additional coverage specific for COVID, it's not going to be covered. But definitively, uh, as until today, as far as I know, no coverage for trip cancellation interruption if the reason to cancel or interrupt the trip is COVID. Right. Yeah, However, and, and uh, can I just clarify one thing too? Because you know, I want to make sure that, uh, if, if in the U.S if you get COVID and then purchase insurance, well, COVID then is a pre-existing condition and, and uh, you're not gonna have coverage. You have to purchase the coverage prior to your trip, prior to contracting it. And, um, and, and that's where the, the COVID coverage would, would come in. Ah, that, that's an important thing. One thing is if you get sick with COVID and you have to cancel your trip, that's a sickness, right? Right. It happens to be COVID. So if you purchase the, the insurance policy before, and then let's say you're traveling six months, you pay your trip, you purchase your insurance, and one month before you go, or sorry, one week before you go, you have COVID, you cannot go in the plane. That's a sickness. It happens to be COVID, but it's a sickness health-related issue forcing you to cancel your trip. That would be covered if you purchase beforehand your your um your emergency, your, sorry, your trip cancellation policy. But let's say that you're going to a, somewhere and you purchase trip cancellation interruption, and then uh, for whatever reason, the airline is not flying because of COVID. So it's not you. The reason is still COVID, but it's not because you're sick with COVID, yeah. but it's because of the pandemic. So let's say one thing is the sickness that you might get, and other thing is COVID as this uh, uh, thing in the world going on and making travel destinations, hotels, cruises, and whatnot, canceling trips because of that. That's what I mean by a known reason for someone to cancel or interrupt. That is what in Canada is not covered by trip cancellation interruption. And I can uh, happily say that that is how it works in the U.S. too. <laughs> yeah. There's something in common. <laughs> That's great. Um, and I think that we should also mention that there are, uh, we have seen, though not quite as much recently, where airlines and some destinations and things like that are offering that kind of cancellation uh, coverage you know, for a purchase. I've not seen it recently, but I certainly saw it uh, in the past. So uh, that might be, the cancellation piece might be topped up by an airline uh, for you in case they have to cancel. Not you have to cancel, but they have to cancel. So that might be something to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, Tracy, is there anything else that we need to, to uh, ask? Just a quick one, I think. Um, um, Catherine is wondering whether the emergence of the new variant, um, if that's going to have an impact on how easy or difficult it will be to get um, insurance during this time. Um, Sam, you want to go? Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand, um, if it's a COVID-19 variant, it's still going to fall under the COVID-19 if you contract it. And um, 
uh, and you contract it, your insurance should um, provide the coverage for you. Um, I have not seen uh, specific language which which are treating variants any you know any differently. Yeah, in Canada so far, no changes have been made to policy wordings. And again, in Canada, we really um, what really rules all this is the travel advisory from the government. So unless there is a new travel advisory by the government saying with an advisory specific to a new variant that could affect travel insurance, uh, again, mainly trip cancellation interruption, not so much emergency medical. Does that wrap it up with the questions, Tracy? Mm -hmm. That was amazing. <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. I hope uh, we, we were able to answer everybody's questions. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. And I thank you both so much. I'm going to be putting together, I'm gonna to watch this all over again and put together yeah. some notes and I which, which I will then send to the two of you okay. to ensure that I am writing this up correctly. Sure thing. And then I will send it to everyone else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Janice and Tracy. I really enjoyed being here and, um, and thank you for all who, who stuck with us and, and listened to what, what can be a complicated um, uh, yeah. discussion, but um, I really appreciate the time. Yeah, no, it was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Invitation. Pleasure to meet you all. And please feel free to contact uh, us whenever you have any travel insurance questions. Yeah, we'll be putting out the contact, your contact, both of your contact information in the uh, follow up. And we'll be posting this uh, online, the video uh, in the next day or two. Great. Thank you. So, thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> have a great uh, have a great evening everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. you too. Take care.